Mr. Larkin, welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. And I think as we discussed, uh, we're going to ask you to make just a few opening comments on the Sixth Amendment. And Lacey's going to go ahead and put the Sixth Amendment up for reference. Uh, and you might, we'll take it down after a little bit, but we'll we'll start with that. Well, listen, I'm honored to have been invited and I look forward to answering questions. Anything dealing with the Constitution is an important matter for people to understand. Politics comes, politics goes, statutes can get passed, revised, or repealed, but the Constitution has been amended on only 20-something occasions, and so what it says is very important for everyone to know. So let's dive right in. Today's focus is on the Sixth Amendment, a provision in the Bill of Rights, and it provides, as you can see on your screen, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall be previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Okay, that's the Sixth Amendment. And let's step back from it for a minute and figure out what is its focus, its meaning, and its purpose. And I think what is clear when you read it is that it is designed to make sure that any criminal trial is as fair as possible. Criminal trials allow the government to impose the most frightful penalties that the state or the federal government can impose on its citizens. And what this provision does is set forth the way a criminal trial can be conducted with that prospect in mind. And keep in mind, while the death penalty is imposed rarely today, back in the 18th century, it was a commonly imposed punishment. So when you're looking at the Sixth Amendment, you're looking at what the frame is thought was essential to be sure that a trial was as fair as possible. Okay. Now that we've looked at it broadly, let's start going through it. The first four words are in all criminal prosecutions. Those are words of limitation. If you have a dispute with somebody over whether that person broke a contract, you can't rely on the Sixth Amendment. If you have a dispute with someone over a tort, say you slipped and fell on their property, the Sixth Amendment is inapplicable. The term in all criminal prosecutions is a term of limitation. And what comes next says the accused, well, what is it that makes you accused? Is it an arrest? No. Is it being arrested and taken to jail to be held? No. And you become an accused when a formal charge is filed. And that's important because once a formal charge is filed, the remainder of the provisions, particularly the right to counsel, then get engaged. It then goes on to say, shall enjoy the right. That is a guarantee of constitutional significance. Congress can't revise it and take it away. The states, if it applies to them, can't revise it and take it away. It was seen as a foundational requirement. Why? Because every state had guarantees like the Sixth Amendment. And there was a great outcry against the Constitution when it was proposed, because it didn't include all of these guarantees. And a great many people said it should not be adopted because it didn't have the guarantees of confrontation, of compulsory process, right to counsel, all of that. And while the framers assumed that Congress would never violate these, they essentially sent the message out to the land that we will amend it as soon as it becomes law by adding these in. And that's in fact what the very first Congress did. Now, now that you've looked at the specific guarantees, one of the things you have to do whenever you're interpreting the constitution, just like whenever you're interpreting any document is look not myopically at the particular provision you're dealing with. Like I said, that's important because those terms have meaning. But you also have to step back and look at the rest of the document. For example, if you look at Article 3 of the Constitution, you will see that it 
has the first half of the Sixth Amendment. It guarantees a right to a trial, and it has to be in a particular district. But it doesn't have the second half of the Sixth Amendment, all of the rights that we've come to know that are applicable at trial, confrontation, compulsory process, et cetera. Plus, if you look at a companion provision of the Bill of Rights, the Fifth Amendment, you will see that it says no person shall be held essentially for a felony charge, a capital or other infamous crime, unless they are indicted by a grand jury. And then there's an exception. The exception says in case, except in cases in the land and naval forces or in the militia when they're called into federal duty. That exception recognizes that the military has always had its own criminal justice system. And that military criminal justice system is the way the military enforces discipline, not only through the rules that are applicable to the average person, don't commit murder, don't commit rape, don't commit assault, et cetera, but also through a lot of other provisions that are designed to ensure that people are upright and ready in case the nation is in peril. And if you've never seen a military court martial, there are numerous ones that have been portrayed in the media the movie A Few Good Men, or the movie The Kane Mutiny, or the remake of the latter, The Kane Mutiny Court Martial. Those will give you some idea, although what Hollywood shows you has to be taken with a grain of salt. But believe it or not, military tribunals can also be used in another context, and they have been. They can be used to try military terror, uh, non-combatants or terrorists. We had a famous prosecution early in 1942 against what are what were called the Nazi saboteurs. Uh, Germany landed a bunch of people in the United States in order to commit various acts of terrorism. They were tried con and convicted before a military tribunal. And that could happen again in various contexts today. So the essential message of the Sixth Amendment is this is what is the minimum prerequisite to have a fair trial. And most of those provisions show up in the second half. And some of the terms there mean more than one thing at a time. For example, it says you have the right to confront witnesses. Well, that means they actually have to bring the witness into court in a large number of cases. And yes, you get the opportunity to cross-examine them. But the confrontation clause is also designed to make sure that the government can't prove its case just by getting affidavits from people and submitting those in. So you have various guarantees that are designed to make sure trials are fair. And there have been numerous Supreme Court cases interpreting the variety of them. And with that in mind, let me bring my opening remarks to an end and allow you and everyone else to ask whatever questions you'd like. Well, thank you so much. That was a great overview. And I'm going to turn it over to Janine. Janine, I'm sure you've got some questions lined up. Well, here I am. Yes, I'm actually going to pass to Tova to go first today. Tova's always, um, and I'm going, then I'll be second. It sounds good. Um, well, thank you so much for that that great overview. Uh, I just had a few uh, questions zooming in on different clauses of this amendment. Um, so to start, I wanted to talk a bit about what it means to have the right to a public trial. Um, is it required that you have a public trial? What if the defense doesn't doesn't want a public trial for whatever reason? Um, and now in such a social media, like viral driven age where we've seen recently, there have been very big public trials that have often become media circuses. I'm thinking of like celebrities like Johnny Depp. That was a big trial. Um, in what ways does the right to a public trial kind of intersect with concerns about privacy uh, and the age of digital media? The right to a public trial is principally designed to ensure that someone can't be railroaded. If you have the trial in public, that is, members of the community can come in to see what's happening. You have the opportunity to show the public that you're not railroading somebody, you're following all the rules so that if someone is convicted and if he or she winds up in prison, that person was properly convicted 
rather than go through what the Soviet Union used to have, which are just show trials, where everybody read from a script and it didn't make a difference whether you were guilty or innocent because they had predetermined the result. The fact that it's public is a guarantee for the defendant. Now, there has been a variety of different litigation, principally brought by newspapers, because there are times defendants do not want a public trial because of the nature of the defense or the nature of the crime that is charged against someone. But newspapers have been able to persuade the Supreme Court that the First Amendment creates a right of access in all but a very narrow category of cases, such as parts of a trial where there may be classified information that it is at issue. Let's say it's an espionage case. Uh, but generally speaking, the public nowadays gets more of a right to see a trial uh, under the First Amendment than, than the Sixth, although the Sixth Amendment does play a role. The type of problem you talk about with privacy was not one that the framers were concerned about. They were more concerned about the fairness of the proceeding. Keep in mind, you could be convicted of a felony and executed. And keep this in mind, too. One other feature that stands out from the Sixth Amendment as a whole is the focus on the trial process. Why is that? We didn't have an appellate process by and large in many places in the 18th century. We didn't have relitigation on federal habeas corpus that we do now. The trial was not just the main show. It was by and large the only show. So the, the first Congress and the framers generation wanted to make sure they got it right for that reason, because the penalties were rather drastic. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. Um, and then I was curious, could you talk to our audience about the process of jury selection? Um, because, you know, it, obviously this amendment guarantees the right to an impartial jury, but how functionally do we actually ensure that a jury is impartial? Um, again, especially if a trial is maybe very well known or if it's a small community where people might be familiar with parties involved. Right. The trial has to be before an impartial jury. Therefore, there are certain categories of people that would automatically be excluded. For example, you wouldn't have the defendant's family members sit on the jury. You wouldn't have uh, a, a jury composed entirely of police or prosecutors. Anyone who had uh, offered an opinion on the case before the trial began would have to be excluded because the purpose of the trial is to have the government bring all of its evidence to bear and have a neutral, dispassionate judgment by 12 people generally as to whether or not what the government says is true, in fact, is true. It happens in stages. First, you wind up collecting people from the state or district where the, uh, the charge uh, is brought. That can be done by looking at uh, voting lists, by uh, telephone lists, by tax lists, you get a broad number of people and you select from them. They then come in and the prosecution and the defense counsel can ask questions to make sure that they haven't made up their mind. I mean, a person who says, well, the police wouldn't arrested him if he wasn't guilty, that person is not allowed to sit on the jury because the person has shown a bias in favor of one side or the other. Uh, you know, if somebody says, oh, hey, this person did me a great favor and he's the, I can't believe no matter what the evidence says, this person committed this crime. I think he's innocent. That person would be excused. So then you winnow from the people that are brought in a group of people who you are sure, even if they know something about the case, can nonetheless say and honestly and be found to have been honest by the judge that they will decide the case based exclusively on the evidence that's presented in court, not TV reports, not written media reports, not social media reports, entirely on the evidence. So you start big and then you winnow that down to get 12. Great, and then I was wondering if you could talk about the process of this amendment being incorporated to the states. Uh, I I recall that it was Gideon v. Rain, uh, Rainwright that incorporated it to the states, at least the right to uh, have a public defender. So could you talk a bit about that? Um, what state pros prosecutions and trials were like before the amendment was incorporated to the states and where we are today? Certainly. Um, 
the, the Sixth Amendment focusing on the trial has to be read in light of the common law. And ironically, at common law, if you were charged with a misdemeanor, you could have an attorney represent you. But if you were charged with a felony, you could not. The theory was that the trial judge would look out for your interests because the penalty at common law for a felony conviction was death. So the theory was the judge would essentially be the defense attorney. The, the framers and everybody early in the nation realized, no, that just doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but they put a provision in there to make sure uh, that the federal government couldn't pass a statute allowing that to happen. And it says you have the right to the assistance of counsel. Now, early on, that did not mean that the government had to provide you a lawyer if you couldn't afford one. That came later in a case called Johnson versus Zerps, decided in the 1930s. Uh, and it was also the case that the Sixth Amendment didn't guarantee you a right in a state criminal prosecution. The reason was in the 19th century, the Supreme Court said that the Bill of Rights applies only to the federal government, not to the states. It was only later in the 20th century, uh, principally, that the Supreme Court started applying the Bill of Rights provisions to the states. What the Supreme Court said was, after the Civil War, we passed the 14th Amendment, which prohibited the states from depriving anyone of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And in so doing, one of the requirements of due process is you have a fundamentally fair trial. And therefore, they started incorporating the different provisions in the Sixth Amendment and elsewhere as prerequisites to have a fundamentally fair trial. The case you mentioned, Gideon versus Wainwright, was the case where the Supreme Court said, Given the way trials are conducted these days with professional prosecutors governed by rules of procedure and evidence, the trial can't be fundamentally fair if the defendant doesn't have a lawyer. And if he can't afford one because he's, he or she is indigent, the state has to provide the lawyer. So we now have a circumstance where both the federal and state governments have to provide someone who is indigent the, uh, a lawyer. Usually it's a public defender, but in many instances, it also could be somebody who's appointed from the local community to represent someone because it is deemed a responsibility of members of the bar to serve the constitution. And this is one way it can be done. So uh, at the time the Sixth Amendment was adopted, you didn't have a guarantee that an attorney would be appointed for you. You had a guarantee that if you could afford one, you would, you would that person could appear for you. But now we've moved well past that and no person, whether in federal or state court, who wants a lawyer but can't afford it, uh, can be sentenced to any term of imprisonment unless that person has a lawyer to represent him or her. Thank you so much for that. That was so interesting. I, I didn't realize that uh, you could get a, a defender for a, a misdemeanor, but not a not a larger crime. That's really interesting. Um, well, now, it, 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 there's one qualification. If the judge at the outset says, I will not impose any term of imprisonment on a, someone who's charged with a misdemeanor, uh, I'm at most just going to fine you, then he doesn't have to uh, have a lawyer appointed for you. And that allows a lot of things in traffic court and otherwise to go without having a public defender. But generally, if you're talking about serious crimes, felonies, you're, you're going to have a lawyer. Got it. Well, uh, thank you for all of that. And now we'll pass on to Janine for her questions. Hello. Thank you, Tova. Um, hello, Mr. Markins. Great to see you today. Oh, it's a pleasure. And please call me Paul. I'm very informal. Okay, Paul, well, I, gosh, your, your resume is just extravagant and wonderful and prestigious. And I'm looking at all of that thinking, oh, I have so many questions about the things that you've done. Um, gosh, where to begin? This is really, you know, it seems like it's so simple, but it's actually very complicated. Can you um, explain to me and to our students that are listening that are maybe in middle school and, and high school, you, I think you just said something where the Bill of Rights at first were not applied to the states. Did you say that or did I hear that incorrectly? No, I did say it. In the 19th century, in a case called Barron versus City of Baltimore, the plaintiff argued that the uh, City of Baltimore took his uh, wharf uh, for their own use. And therefore, he said he was entitled to just compensation because a clause in the Fifth Amendment says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. 
And the then Chief Justice, John Marshall, perhaps the most famous of all the Supreme Court justices, uh, said mm -hmm. that no, the bill, the just compensation requirement only applies if the federal government takes your property, because the Bill of Rights itself only applies to the federal government. Now that has changed. Late in the 19th century, the Supreme Court said, no, the just compensation requirement, the whole takings clause, in fact, does now apply to the states. So if a city, which is really just a corporation created by the state, or a state takes your property, you have to pay just compensation now. If the city or the state charges you with a crime, the Sixth Amendment then comes into play because the Supreme Court has incorporated it against the states. So... Yes, there was a time when the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. And there is very little of the Bill of Rights now that hasn't been incorporated. But there, the Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial in civil cases hasn't. But if the K issue ever got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court might say, no, that does too. So you're talking about if the state were the plaintiff, the state itself. Yeah, if the state was one the, aspect of it. If the state brings a criminal charge against somebody, then uh, the Sixth Amendment comes into play, uh, as well as other provisions in the Constitution, like the Fourth Amendment. But it didn't originally. If it was, if it involved the state itself, there's like the state, not the state's people. Originally, right. if it involved the state, it was not going to apply. That's right. Like the war. That's right, and. Keep in mind that when James Madison was drafting the Constitution and when he was putting the Bill of Rights together and the first Congress was considering it, they knew that the states had rights in their own state constitutions. And they they assumed that the, if you were tried in a state court for a state crime, the state constitution would protect you. So that if a state had a right to a jury in its own constitution, and you would be able to invoke your right to jury under the state constitution and that they didn't need to legislate through the constitution for the states because they saw the states as having an independent legal status and having their own constitutional obligations and that the states would respect them. So the framers, when they adopted the constitution and then when the first Congress proposed the Bill of Rights, acted against a background that the states had their own constitutions that the federal government was in no way uh, nullifying. The federal constitution lay atop whatever guarantees you had under state law, at least certainly in, in respect to criminal prosecutions. Like an umbrella policy. Yeah, I mean, there are provisions in the basic constitution that regulate what the states can do. If you look to Article 1, Section 9, you will see that the states cannot pass ex post facto laws, which means they can't pass uh, a statute that retroactively makes something a crime. And they can't pass bills of attainder, which were statutes at one time Parliament passed where they named a particular John or Jane Doe as a criminal so that that person wouldn't have a trial and would just be punished. So there were provisions in the in the Constitution itself that regulated what the states could do with their criminal process. But the trial rights, how the trials were conducted, that was something that the Constitution did not govern what the states could do until the Sixth Amendment became part of the Constitution. Yeah. Were we talking about that brief year before the the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights were right away after the Constitution was. What do That's you mean right. when the Sixth Amendment part of the Constitution? Are we are we talking about that small window? Wait, there was a small window after the Constitution was adopted and before the Sixth Amendment was adopted. Yeah. That well, all of the amendments because the first the first Bill of Rights were all pretty much done together, weren't they? That's, oh, the first ten were no question. Uh, yeah. and when they went into effect, uh, all the guarantees in the Sixth Amendment applied to the federal government. They didn't apply to the states until the Supreme Court incorporated them, and that happened in the 20th century. Ah, uh, okay. That's where it gets confusing, <laughs> when they incorporated them. Okay. Why is something so simple so confusing? Um, uh, I'm looking here at... Um, you, to have assistance of, it says here in the Sixth Amendment, to have 
the assistance of counsel for his defense. Um, and you were saying there's some some circumstances where you don't have to have that. You don't have the right. Well, I, I know what my question was about. You said indigent. You have to be indigent to have free counsel. So I thought the bar was a little bit higher than that. So what what does indigent mean? I mean, if, if you make a beneath a certain amount of money or you have zero money, I mean, when do you get that? Uh, the assist have the assistance of counsel for his defense. What does that mean? I mean, it's like. The, they'll pay for it. Is that kind of what they meant? And then when you say in order to get that paid for lawyer, so to speak, you have to be indigent. What's that definition? Because I've always well, wondered, like if I'm watching a trial and they have their, you know, a uh, court given attorney, what were the what were the bars for that? OK, um, it's a question not just of income, but of assets. I mean, if you have no income, but you have enormous wealth, uh, you are not remotely indigent. Uh, it's essentially designed to address whatever poverty level uh, is used as the means of calculating the amount of income and or assets that would allow you to retain a lawyer. And by and large, uh, I think the, whatever the, the standard definition of poverty would be that the federal government uses is probably what the states also use. And for example, if you're homeless and you are arrested, uh, you have no income except maybe a small amount of social security, you have no assets, uh, you could not be tried uh, at risk of being imprisoned unless the government provides you with a public defender or a free attorney in some other way. So if you're I, indigent, that's right. I don't you know. Have to be that's right. I don't know what the exact dollar test is to define mm -hmm. indigent, uh, but whatever the test is, that is the test they go by to decide whether you get a lawyer appointed for you. Really interesting. Uh, but it says here, it says, um, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense, it doesn't say if you're indigent. Well, that's right. Um, but the Supreme Court decided in the 1960s that first, a trial must be fundamentally fair. And in the 1960s, we had developed a system where there were professional prosecutors. Uh, it wasn't always the case that there was a professional prosecutor and staff and the like. There wasn't always a case there were police forces. That wasn't an invention until the 19th century. It started in uh, Great Britain uh, and then moved over to this country. We had sheriffs and we had some deputy sheriffs, but we didn't have professional police forces. So what happened was the Supreme Court said, look, you've got professional prosecutors, you've got professionals who are collecting all the evidence, whether they're deputy sheriffs or police, and the defendant, if he can't afford a lawyer, can't get a fair trial unless we make sure that the state provides him with one, because it is not fundamentally fair to balance the equities in that manner. So the right to have an attorney, although grounded in the Sixth Amendment, also is influenced by the need to have fundamental fairness in the uh, prosecution of anyone for uh, a crime. You know, it seems to me kind of a, in closing here, because I just tossed, but it, it seems, it seems, uh, um, it's a slippery slope, doesn't it? Where, the Bill of Rights and the Bill of Rights, then they can't really, they're locked in and they can't really be interpreted. You know, they can't really be changed. And the, yet the court comes in and changes them. Where, well, you know, the, the, and I, I'm still, it's, 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 it, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say there are terms in the Constitution that are fairly cl clear. For example, the clearest of the ones setting age limits that you have to satisfy in order to be members of the House, the Senate, or to be the president. Then there are other terms that have some greater breadth that can be interpreted. Uh, a criminal prosecution, does that include uh, traffic? Uh, does that include uh, prosecutions where there is only a fine that could be brought? Because, for example, you're prosecuting a corporation which can't be sent to prison. So terms like that. The Due Process Clause, which is what the Supreme Court relied on in Gideon, is a much broader term. 
because the Supreme Court has said we have the uh, ability to interpret that to assure that a trial is fundamentally fair. So that gives them a little more leeway. Remember, anyone who can afford a lawyer can have a lawyer. The, the Supreme Court didn't say if you're wealthy or even just middle class, you can't have a lawyer represent you. What they did was come at it from the other direction. If you are essentially poor and can't afford an attorney and are facing a serious criminal charge, then the state can't go forward with a trial that could result in imprisonment unless they make sure that you have an attorney. Yeah, but I think what I'm saying is, I think it already says that. I don't think we need a Supreme Court to tell us that because it says, and to have assistance of counsel for his defense. So it's like, there's a guarantee of assistance of counsel for your defense. I don't know why the Supreme, in this like a 30 second answer, because I got to toss. I don't know why the Supreme Court had to interpret that because it says you're entitled to assistance of counsel for your defense. Right. The presumption at the time was that entitlement applied only if you could afford an attorney or persuade someone to represent, represent you for free. You get the assistance of counsel if you can persuade somebody to represent you. It doesn't mean that you have uh, a guarantee that the state will provide that particular instrument. Yeah. Keep, in, keep in mind, okay. the Fifth Amendment takings clause says they can't take your property without paying you just compensation. It doesn't say in the Sixth Amendment they can't try you without paying a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Just says you're right. Have to, okay. Right to the assistance of counsel. And if you could get one, that means you get one. But if you can't, uh, now the state and the federal government have yeah. to. Uh huh. It, it's a different way you interpret the words, you know, right. It's like, what's your right? You have the right to pay for one or you have the right to get one. And I think that's where it's murky. Um, yeah. Keep so. in mind that at common law, if you were charged with a felony, you didn't have the right to be represented by a lawyer, no matter what you paid them. So that the mm -hmm. purpose of this clause was designed to prevent that from happening, not to ensure Fascinating. That, not to ensure that a poor person. Yeah. Had it. Interesting. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. I pass. All right, we have uh, thrown out a bunch of questions. This is an interesting topic. Um, first of all, I'm wondering if has there ever been a challenge to the to a civil case saying that with the forfeiture of property uh, that they should still be protected under the Sixth Amendment? So trying to make a claim that uh, it was a civil case, but it should, but they you should still be protected under a criminal uh, under criminal law. Well, that's an. Uh, a question that involves the interpretation not only of the Sixth Amendment, but of the Eighth. Uh, because the Eighth Amendment deals with uh, punishments, which includes fines. And the Supreme Court has said fines can be excessive. And if the purpose of a fine is purely to be punitive, then the question is, first, do you have the right to a trial under the Sixth Amendment? Because this is a punitive proceeding being brought against you. Uh, I am I know there have been a numerous challenges brought in the civil forfeiture area, but I'm not familiar with one where the Supreme Court has said if the civil forfeiture, if the forfeiture proceeding is really more criminal than civil, then the Sixth Amendment applies. So it may be that I, I just missed that or forgot it, or it may be that it just hasn't been litigated yet. Uh, it has been litigated under the Eighth Amendment, and the Supreme Court has said, yes, civil fines can be excessive and therefore prohibited by the Eighth Amendment. Uh, and so maybe what we'll see is a case in the future bringing this issue up to its attention. It's interesting because of how much power, of course, there are in civil cases. Um, another question is when we are we have the guarantee of uh, a jury of our peers, and I'm wondering, has it been challenged often when there's a, a case that's with someone that does not live where they are being charged or prosecuted, and so make a claim that those the jury is not their peers. Okay. Uh, well, let me just add one other thing to the last question before I get to that. I focused on the Sixth and the Eighth Amendments because they come up in criminal cases. There's also the Seventh Amendment, which grants you a right to a civil jury trial uh, where more than $20 is at issue, which is rather easily satisfied today. And my guess is that the Seventh Amendment would be the better basis for making the argument that you have a right to a jury trial. 
it doesn't necessarily grant the rest of the rights that the Sixth Amendment has, but it would allow you at least to have the jury when the government seeks to forfeit your property. Now, as to jury of your peers, uh, the Constitution tries to address that by saying you have to be uh, charged where the crime shall have been committed, because what they're trying to do is prevent the situation where, let's say this is the 18th century, this is the 19th century, late in the 19th century, you, you're arrested for smuggling something into Boston and they decide they're going to charge you in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, that's not where the crime was committed. The crime was committed in Boston because you tried to smuggle something in without paying the dues. And so by requiring that you be uh, charged and tried in that venue, you are essentially trying to make sure that somebody gets a jury of his or her peers because they're the people from the district where the crime is supposed to have occurred. Uh, if you, however, commit the crime on the high seas, let's say it's piracy. Piracy is essentially murder and robbery on the high seas. Uh, because it's outside of any particular state or jurisdiction, then Congress can decide where you can be prosecuted. And oftentimes the option is either at the closest point to where the crime occurred or in the District of Columbia, which is kind of a fallback. So you're, you're always trying to make sure a person has a jury of his or her peers by making sure that the trial goes forward in the district where the crime commit, is committed. It isn't really designed to deal with peers in the sense of people from a peerage, because there's another part of the Constitution that prohibits the use of titles of nobility and the like, so that uh, if you were a, a member of the upper crust, you could say, my peers are only members of the upper crust. No, sorry, that's not the way it works. There are no titles of nobility in this country, and you, you're going to be tried in the district where the crime occurred, and that's what they mean by peers. Very interesting. Uh, my last question um, will be that when you believe that is, are there any recourses to a defendant who believes that the process, there's something wrong with the process or the judge is violating one of these amendments uh, or does they have to wait for what the, what they would believe is an unjust opinion or conviction and then appeal it um, in, in every case, no matter like, even if the judge does something totally just explicitly wrong and it's it's obvious that there's some violation of process do you still have to wait for the full well you don't have to wait but there are more laws that are involved in that regard than just the sixth amendment uh there are a variety of statutes that address this sort of problem for example suppose the prosecutor uh was the brother uh of the judge or sister or father, mother, something like that. That's an obvious uh, matter for concern because the judge is supposed to be neutral and impartial and whatever the relationship familial or otherwise between the government and the judge is going to disrupt that. Now, the Constitution doesn't address that problem except to say you have a fundamentally fair trial. But there are statutes that would allow you before trial uh, to move to have the judge recused because of the fact or an appearance of bias. So keep in mind, the Constitution was supposed to be the bare minimum. They knew that uh, Congress was going to have to lay out the rest of the trial process. And they knew that Congress was going to have to address these sorts of issues. So what the framers and the first Congress did was try through the Constitution and the Bill of Rights to put out the basics and then leave to the Congress and then, of course, to the states, the opportunity to fill out the rest. Keep in mind that when the federal government was created, you already had states and the states had criminal justice systems. And so the, the framers and the first Congress assumed that uh the elected officials who are now going to implement the Constitution are going to look to see what the states do and model the federal criminal justice system on what the states do uh, and the like. So you don't have everything in the Constitution that creates a criminal justice system, but that's because the framers in the first Congress knew there was legislative work that had to be done later. 
great. Uh, could you just tell me why it was necessary to put a speedy trial into this amendment? What was there? Were they particularly fighting against criminals being held or was it just to ensure that it was that a speedy trial? Well, speedy, uh, obviously a term that it doesn't define by days how fast a trial has to be done, uh, is a term designed to ensure fairness to the defendant. Why? Keep in mind, the average lifespan in the 18th century wasn't what it is now. The people died. And if your uh, the witness against you died, that may scuttle the prosecution's case because he couldn't be brought into court. But if your witness died, uh, you're now in a real pickle. I mean, if you're charged with smuggling something into Boston and you have witnesses that you can bring in to show that you were in New York at the time this happened, they've just made a mistake. It wasn't you who was responsible. If they, if you don't have the right to a speedy trial, you're at risk of your witnesses dying, of records being lost or destroyed. The speedy nature of the trial is designed to not only to keep someone from languishing in jail until there is a trial, although it has that function, it's also designed to help add to the accuracy of the trial result by making sure that witnesses don't die or move uh, or that records are lost and the like. So it, it serves a very important function in making sure that the trial is fair by avoiding these complications. Thank you. It got late really quick. Uh, I think it's time we have to pass to Kathy for some audience questions. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Jewel and Jorn and Tova and Janine, the great questions. And before we go to the audience questions, we want to give a shout out to some of our students and teachers that are watching today. Hope Mucklow with Homeschool Students, uh, D'Angela Hines with the Emerald Coast Christian Academy, and Cami Wainos with Homeschool Students. All have students watching. So if you're a teacher or student watching and we didn't give you a shout out, just uh, drop your name in the Q&A and we'll uh, be sure and try to recognize you before the end of the podcast. We also want to thank radio station KKVV at 1060 AM on the radio dial in Las Vegas, Nevada, that airs these podcasts Monday evenings at 6 PM Pacific. So thank you, KKVV and all of our listeners in Las Vegas. So Mr. Larkin, we, uh, our listeners have got some questions related to the Sixth Amendment and current events. Uh, Meredith asked, first of all, if could you talk a little bit about the issue of FBI questioning terror suspects who asked for a lawyer? Right. Um, if you have been charged with a crime, you are now accused. And so the Sixth Amendment comes into play. And what the Supreme Court has said, if you are questioned after becoming an accused, you have a Sixth Amendment protection against the government asking you questions that tend to incriminate you. So if you have been charged with a crime, the Sixth Amendment comes into play. And therefore, uh, you can't be questioned, or at least you can be questioned, but they can't use the evidence against you at trial. But there's a possible emergency exception here. I mean, for example, suppose someone, suppose there were 10, uh, 10 people who were charged with a crime and you couldn't find one or more of them. And then you found that person. That person is protected by the Sixth Amendment. But if there were a true emergency, if, the, for example, there was a bomb somewhere that you knew this person had information about, you might be able to go ahead and question that person and use the evidence against him or her because of this emergency. That is true if you have not been charged with a crime. If you've not been charged with a crime, the famous Miranda versus Arizona case comes into play. And you can't be questioned in a custodial setting if you have not first been given Miranda warnings. But the Supreme Court has created an exception to the Miranda requirement for emergencies. And it's likely they would use the same exception if someone has been charged with a crime. So if there is an emergency, in all likelihood, uh, the FBI is going to be able to question someone uh, and therefore be able to use the evidence against him or her because 
these are evidentiary rules that the Supreme Court itself has made up and so they can modify them. And then Jill follows up to that asking, does the Sixth Amendment come into play uh, at Guantanamo Bay in cases there? The Sixth Amendment would not apply if you're being charged in a military tribunal. Uh, that is a different set of rules that govern. And you would have the right to have a lawyer appointed for you uh, because those are the rules that the military has adopted in order to deal with the prosecution of terrorists and the like. But the Quirin case that the Supreme Court decided in 1942 essentially allows military tribunals to be used to prosecute terrorists and therefore people at Guantanamo who are being held and charged as terrorists would be subject to a different regimen of rules that are created specifically for those sorts of cases. Great. And then Larry asks about uh, the Supreme, there was a recent Supreme Court case that I think was decided 9-0 uh, that, that required a, a case to be retried because the venue was uh, an improper venue. Um, I think it was, uh, let's see, was it, I think he had it, uh, oh, here is his question. Um, was it versus Smith versus United States? Do you know anything about that? Yes, I do. Um, but in order to explain what that's about, I need to back up a little. The Fifth Amendment has a provision known as the Double Jeopardy Clause. And it says no one can be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. Mm -hmm. What that's designed to do is prevent the government from trying you over and over and over until it finally convicts you. So if you are acquitted, you cannot be tried at all. If there was an error made at your trial, then you're entitled, and it's and it was prejudicial, you're entitled to a new trial. The Double Jeopardy Clause doesn't ban a retrial for a prejudicial error. In the case that you're mentioning, there was an old 19th century Supreme Court case that indicated that if you were tried in the wrong court, you could the government could not retry you once you persuaded an appellate court to say that you were tried in the wrong court. Okay, you were tried in Maryland ver rather than Virginia or something like that. And this recent Supreme Court decision said, no, the Sixth Amendment doesn't have an equivalent provision to the double jeopardy clause that would prohibit the retrial of someone who was found innocent or found not guilty. Uh, the Sixth Amendment allows for retrials if there is a Sixth Amendment violation and it was prejudicial. So the case that... Um, that person asked about simply said the Sixth Amendment doesn't contain a provision similar to the double jeopardy clause protection for people who are acquitted. So if you're tried in the wrong court, you can be retried in the right one. Interesting. And it was interesting that the Supreme Court uh, went 9-0 on that. You don't normally hear of, of, of unanimous decisions. Well, you don't normally hear of it, but not because they don't exist. Uh, right. It's that... Uh, dissents make cases controversial. And so you're more likely to hear about cases in the media where there's a dissent than where it's unanimous. But a goodly number of Supreme Court decisions, in fact, are unanimous. And in this case, it was just a poorly written 19th century opinion that led to this problem that the Supreme Court eliminated. Interesting. And then Hope Mucklow uh, observes, speedy trial is a joke these days. What can defendants really do? Well, it depends whether you're in federal or state court. Uh, if you are in federal court, there's a statute called the Speedy Trial Act that actually sets definite time periods. It gives content to the term speedy. And so you can require that the government comply with the elements of the Speedy Trial Act. Now, in federal court, uh, most defendants really want to delay the trial rather than come to trial quickly. Why? Most of the cases brought in federal court are white collar crimes, or at least a goodly number where they go to trial are white collar crimes. And the government has been investigating it for perhaps years. So you want the opportunity to see what evidence the government has collected. And that will take more than 30 days, 60 days or 90 days. So put the federal cases to one side. The real problem is in state cases. And in state cases, it's often really a problem dealing with misdemeanors, particularly people who can't make bail for one reason or another. 
That is a serious problem. Uh, but the states are also trying, I think, to clear that problem up. I know in New York, for example, they had a serious problem with a backlog. And then it was one judge in particular that just decided to take on the responsibility of addressing it and tried to clear up that backlog. But what you can do is, is raise before your trial judge a Speedy Trial Act claim, and then perhaps raise it on appeal if you think you're being held in jail too long without a trial. I'm not saying there's a guaranteed good result, but there are sub-constitutional remedies available to people to try to get a judge to rule on a Speedy Trial Act claim. Well, thank you. And we are getting really close to the top of the hour. Janine, I noticed you would pop back on. Did you uh, have another question that you wanted to try to get in? Yes, 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 yes. And I, I kind of realized why that last segment of the Sixth uh, Amendment was uh, confusing me because it's like you have the right you, 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 you they can't do this without the fact that you need to have an attorney. You have, you have the right to an attorney. And I thought it meant you have, anyway, <laughs> there, there are two ways to look at that. But I was just really intrigued with something that you just said, which is um, double jeopardy applies to the fifth, but not the sixth. Well, double jeopardy is a clause in the fifth amendment. It's not mm -hmm. in the Sixth Amendment, but it still applies to the states. It applies to the federal government because it's in the Bill of Rights, and it applies to the states because the Supreme Court has incorporated it as part of the requirement of due process. So if you are tried in a state case and you are acquitted, the state can't try you again on the same charge. Got it. So in other words, you don't need double jeopardy in the six because it's going to be taken care of in the states and the states have double jeopardy. Well, the states have it in their own constitution, but even if they don't, the federal constitution applies the double jeopardy clause against the states. The Supreme Court so held in a case called Benton versus Maryland, 1969, I believe. Uh, and so if you're acquitted in a state case, your state constitution probably protects you, but the federal double jeopardy clause in the Fifth Amendment also protects you. Oh, I thought I heard you say that the double jeopardy clause doesn't apply to the Sixth Amendment. No, that's what got me confused. Well, it's not part of the Sixth Amendment, uh, but it's, it applies yeah. because the Supreme Court has said that it does. Ah, OK. Well, thank, thank you. you. Very, very wonderful. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much, Mr. Larkin. Um, we're at the top of the hour, and we want to thank our audience for being with us today. And remind everyone our auction launches uh, Thursday morning at 8 a.m. Eastern, day after tomorrow. So please go on and bid and invite everyone to join us next week when we talk about the Seventh Amendment. And does anyone else want to say a quick goodbye? Jewel and Jorn? Tova? Yeah, thanks for a wonderful show. That was, we got so many questions in on the show and you kept answering all of them. Thank you. Yeah, you I really appreciate it. Tired after all that. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's my pleasure. I'm glad to help. Well, thank, thank you for inviting me. Thank, thank you, you for sharing thank you. your expertise. My pleasure. And we want to thank you for all the great work the Heritage Foundation does. Thank you. I will pass that on. Check out the resources there. So thank you.